Um, well, uh, we are very blessed to be here. We've actually been following MFF for many years now and wanting to come to a meeting and never able to connect and, and, uh, and come and visit you and be a part of this, but we're so excited that we are now. And we've known uh, Clyde Tabor for many years, and uh, Clyde has been a great inspiration to us, and we, we want to thank you for inviting us and, and inviting us to be able to share. How do you summarize in 18 minutes or less um, things that the Lord has taught us over the last 27 years? Um, I feel like a lot of the speakers that have already come up, uh, especially uh, Dr. Dai, who was up earlier here, basically laid the groundwork work and pretty much stole all of our <laughs> thunder <laughs> here. But uh, we say amen to everything that we've been hearing so far. And Yes, that's right. <laughs> Bless you, brother. I don't even know him. I know him now, though. Anyway, but um, uh, one of the things that God really has spoken to us and really has reminded us of as we were preparing for this and thinking of what are some of the principles, what are some of the elements of God that God has taught us over the years uh, of doing indigenous films is, first of all, having a passion to communicate. And what I mean by that is, I mean, all of us here are evangelists, right? And when I look at this group, I don't just see technocrats or, you know, technology people. I see people whose heart is really to share the gospel, share the greatest story ever told with the world. And it happens that God's given you these uh, technological tools to be able to do it and know how. But really, the heart is an evangelist. And uh, that's really what God really taught us at the very beginning is to have a passion for communication but not just communication but uh, a passion for good clear communication and what I mean by that is that often when we think of communication we think of just transmission and that's only a part of communication that's only the the first step the the most important part of communication is making sure our audience understands right? Making sure our audience understands the message. If we share something, if we transmit a message through whatever medium we use, and our audience doesn't understand it, have we communicated? No, we haven't. And that is really our responsibility. We like to call it uh, being redemptive communicators, God's redemptive communicators. And so that has been our commitment from the very beginning, tw the last 27 years, that whatever we produce, we're making sure that the audience understands our message very clearly. And we take a lot of our inspiration from the Apostle Paul when he said, I've made it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. Uh, and then he also goes on to say, I have been following the plan. And then he quotes a scripture from the Old Testament, a promise. Those who have never been told will see. Those who have never heard will understand. And uh, as we studied the scriptures more and more about this whole area, it becomes clear and clear that uh, Jesus even taught his disciples through the parable of the sower and the seed, that it was those who heard the message and understood it that brought forth fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. So we see that that has really been a core, not just a core principle or core element, but a core commitment for us when we go and do a presentation of the gospel, whether it's through uh, video or through animation or whatever it is. That is a core commitment, and that we have seen fruit come forth whenever we've been committed to that. And then, of course, the heart language. Uh, people have talked about that a lot during this meeting and even uh, during the EMDC. I'm preaching to the choir here, but we, we, can't, we can't say it enough. The heart language is so critical. It's so key to reaching people with a go the gospel message clearly. The language that they speak at home, the language that they speak to the people that are closest to their hearts and their lives that is the language that God uses to speak to them. And when all of us think about our daily lives, our walk with the Lord, 
our relationship with God, what is the language that God speaks to you? It's your heart language, right? And, and so therefore, we need to be committed to using that as well. And uh, I, I saw a very poignant example of this recently with uh, the passing away of a great man, Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, do you know Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore? He was the prime minister and the author of the Singapore Miracle. And uh, you can see the speech of his son up on YouTube. And of course, there's three official languages in Singapore, English, um, Mandarin, and Malay. And so he gave the speech, the memorial speech, in, both, in all three of those languages. The first language he started with English, and uh, he began speaking, and he, in his normal stoic way, shared the facts of his father's life and death. And, but then he went to the next language, Mandarin, which was his heart language. And you know, that man could not stop weeping when he began speaking the same speech, the same words, but in his heart language, he could not control his emotions. And he, he wept like a child through that whole part of the speech until he got to the end and started it in Malay. When he did, he was able to you know, control his emotions again and went through and gave the facts of his father's life and death. And it just again showed me, once again, the power of heart language uh, in our presentations. And of course, uh, when we talk about language and culture, as anthropologists, we're taught that language and culture can't be separated. Language is the expression of cultural ideas. And so the heart culture is what we also want to be committed to doing our presentations in that context. So this was a summary um, oh back you don't want to okay uh, of being faithful to scripture and relevant to culture and then we craft the story with the local workers in the natural context of their world so it's important to keep in mind that our audience is the lost many times we work with the church or Christians and they say oh use this term and we said well will the people that aren't believers understand that term and they go oh probably not well what terms would they know about the creator God and oftentimes that needs to be explained. So we need, so in, in uh, steps of production, we pray a lot. Like if people ask us to do a project, we pray and ask God for revelation of what he would want communicated. Then we do research on internet, but more importantly with the national workers. How have um, people come to know the Lord within your uh, culture? And what dreams is God speaking to them? And so we gather all this, and our script writers are just kind of collecting all these things. And then we write many drafts back and forth. And it depends how involved the local worker would be. We have uh, Chuck in our room who's helping us a lot with our next project our team's doing. And so he's, he knows the culture, and he can give good advice. Sometimes the people don't know that much, so we have to be a lot more proactive, but we look at their stories, their parables, their legends, their dreams, and each presentation we've done has been unique. So we've done over 70 films, and no one is alike, because even neighboring cultures will have different clothes, styles, and foods, so we've tailor-made it. Um, and, and the cool thing is how God's revealing himself to the people, and it's been an exciting process as we script write with guys on the field, and then the actors get involved. Some of them are, are uh, not believers. Often, many times, we're going to unreached people groups. There's not that many believers, and they're willing to go through, um, say the lines, because they see it's very in culture. We've appreciated their culture. We're not putting down any of their prophets or their religious leaders. And the cool thing is, is God's already at work in the culture, and he's saying, Come join me. Don't just bring the gospel here. Join me. I, I'm revealing. I'm doing things. I'm revealing myself through, through legends and parables of the people. And I'm going to really show um, you what uh, best to communicate. And through this all, we ask 
some people ask, what's your minimum requirement to come to a field? And we said, a cultural advisor that you know and trust who would speak our language of the production team, which right now is English, but we do have some non-Western teams going out, and knows the language of the people. And so we can do a whole production if you just give us that one person. But that um, person would be a trusted person, and oftentimes we're doing the production, and they go, okay, now stop and add some humor. We're like, oh, we're sharing the gospel message. And they go, no, no, the people won't respond if you don't add some humor. I go, okay, what's humor to you guys? And some it's been quite earthy and different things. But I remember in our Isan film, it's got one of our hugest downloads. And um, we just trusted them. They knew, and they all, you know, would do something that we're all sitting there going, that's not funny to us, but they were laughing. So we go, it's for you guys. You guys just will help you do it. And so the greatest compliment we've had is when uh, a number of our films, they, we don't put credits on our films, so oftentimes they don't know it's from our group. They go, we thought Uyghurs, we thought, um, Tuja people produced this film. You guys produced the film? We go, yeah. You know, we did it a few years ago. And they go, wow. And, and one guy came to our, one of our training schools, and he goes, I came to know the Lord through that film. We're like, oh, yes. He goes, but he said, I didn't know you guys did it. I thought my, my colleagues, my fellow Uyghur people did it. And also, when they say, thank you for honoring our culture, and that's the contextual media is the best way to ensure use by our intended audience. So really the evangelists that we are looking to, of course, uh, equip all evangelists, but the best evangelists that we found are the people from that people group themselves. As they've been involved in this project and they've embraced it and they said, this is ours then they, they, they take off. They do amazing things. Tujia people, we did a Tujia project in China, and uh, these people are not rich by any means, but they love the film so much, they duplicated and paid for 100,000 copies of the film and distributed it themselves. And uh, you know when you see those kinds of numbers, that kind of response, that it's going to have a great impact. And uh, another example I wanted to give to you of this, we did a project for the Maderese, Muslim, very devout Muslim group in Indonesia, and uh, uh, eight of the nine actors were Muslims. And uh, we, they went through, they memorized scripture, they did the whole script and the story, and they loved being a part of it. And uh, four weeks after we had finished the actual production on the field, all eight of those uh, Muslim actors became Christians. And then they took the film and showed it to their family and their extended family and tried to, to share the gospel with them using the film. And uh, the, the uh, missionary we were working with at the time, he said he took off for a couple of days. He had just made 200 and some copies of the film, put it on his desk, and he came back after a couple of days and they were gone. And so he asked his team, which were Madri's people, uh, and uh, said, what happened to these? And they said, oh, we distributed them all. We went and took them to all of our families. And, and uh, the, about a year after that uh, project had been completed, uh, the uh, missionary we were working with told us this story. He said, one of my guys, uh, he has a job, one of his jobs anyway, is going around the island of Java and going to video shops and giving movies, right? The latest movie, and he sells it to them and that kind of thing. And uh, he came back after a two-month trip and told our friend, he said, you know that movie we filmed a year ago, that Madari's one? I found it in every single one of those video shops all through the island of Java. What evidently happened is the guy who did the duplication for them in their city then passed it on to the next guys and passed it on, and it just went viral uh, to literally millions uh, of people. And so we call that Holy Spirit piracy, and we're praying that into every one of our projects. But uh, so those kind of miraculous things God can do, what can we do? One of the other things that we are doing is we've created a website called indigitube.tv, which I think should show up here if I've clicked the button right. There we go. That's just playing a little video through it. 
But in digitube.tv, it's got about 240 of our films and animations, all downloadable for free in two different formats, MP, uh, MP4 and 3GP. 3GP for feature phones. MP4 can play on a number of different mobile devices. It is also a mobile-friendly uh, website. So basically, uh, every, any device that it detects that's accessing it, I think it's going, is it? Yeah, accesses it. Uh, it reconfigures itself to play properly and the best quality on that mobile device. And uh, another thing that we're doing is getting on different uh, apps. And uh, we don't, we're not a, whoops, that shouldn't be black, but let me just, yeah, okay, that's better. Um, we don't have a lot of money to, you know, make our own app. We're maybe going to do that in the future, but in the meantime, we want to get our content on other people's apps. And there's a great uh, app that's out in ministry called Colo World. I don't know if you've heard of it. How many people have heard of Colo World? Oh, several. That's very good. So Colo World, they started with Colo Africa, but Colo World uh, has now been released. And we've got about 20 of our films uh, on that platform. And we just continue to, um, not responding here. Oh. oh, okay. Sorry about that. It looks, it's a different picture there than it is up there. That's okay. Um, so we continue to just uh, release our materials to uh, ministries that we've made relationship with uh, that have apps and other kinds of platforms. So, uh, again, this, these films are free to use. We say that um, Jesus holds the copyright, and we really mean that. And we want them to be used and distributed uh, as much as possible. Um, just, just the final um, was that we want to see disciple-making movements, and some of us at EMDC heard that from David Watson, but it's more important the aspect that the people have come to the Lord and they want to know, how can I flesh out my faith now in a new community? And if at all possible in the films we produce to show them what it would be like to live out their faith in community. We, the optimal in our film is that the person would come to know the Lord in a very natural way, and then it shows them entering into a home fellowship. And the feedback we've gotten is that that is one of the key parts because we had um, in the Comarine people of Sumatra and the husband had come to know the Lord but the wife hadn't so he was studying the film on his um, laptop and the wife came by and she goes, is that what you're talking about? A fellowship of Jesus followers? And he said, yes. And she goes, if that's what it is, I'm in. And he goes, oh, I've been telling you about it. And he goes, but I had to see it. I had to experience it. And so build that into it. Help the people know if they're going to leave their family and different things and enter into a new kingdom identity, this is what it's going to be like. And they don't have to leave their culture. They can be fully Madaris, fully Tuja, fully uh, Tajik, and yet love and follow Jesus. So that, that's really our goal, that they would see and understand and follow Jesus within their cultural context.